Hello guys, this is Indian Medico and in this video, we will see a review of biostatistics. First let us see about sensitivity and specificity of a test. Sensitivity is the ability of a test to detect a disease. Mathematically, it is the number of true positives divided by the number of people with the disease. Sensitivity is equal to true positive divided by true positive plus false negative. Tests with high sensitivity are used for disease screening. False positive results occur but the test does not miss many people with the disease that is it has low false negative rate. Now let us see about specificity it is the ability of a disease to detect health or non-disease. Mathematically it is calculated as number of true negatives divided by the number of people without the disease that is specificity is equal to true negatives divided by false positives plus true negatives. Tests with high specificity are used for disease confirmation. False negative results occur but the test does not call anyone sick who is actually healthy that is it has low false positive rate. The ideal confirmatory test must have high sensitivity and high specificity otherwise people with the disease may be called healthy. Now let us see about the relationship between sensitivity and specificity. This curve shows normal subjects and this curve shows diabetic patients. If cutoff serum glucose value for diabetes mellitus is set at point A, no cases of diabetes will be missed but many people without diabetes will be mislabeled as diabetics that is point A has higher sensitivity and lower specificity. If cutoff is set at point B, diagnosis of diabetes mellitus will not be made in healthy people but many cases of true diabetes will go undiagnosed that is point B has lower sensitivity and higher specificity. The optimal diagnostic value lies somewhere between points A and B. Now let us see about positive predictive value or PPV. When a test is positive for disease, the PPV measures how likely it is that the patient has the disease. That is, positive predictive value is the probability of having a condition given a positive test. Mathematically, it is calculated as true positive divided by the total number of people with a positive test. That is, positive predictive value is equal to true positive divided by true positive plus false positive. Higher the prevalence of a disease, higher the positive predictive value and overly sensitive test that gives more false positive results as a lower positive predictive value. Now let us see about negative predictive value or NPV. When a test comes back negative for disease, the negative predictive value measures how likely it is that the patient is healthy and does not have the disease. That is negative predictive value is the probability of not having a condition given a negative test. Mathematically, it is calculated as true negative divided by the total number of people with a negative test. That is, negative predictive value is equal to true negative divided by false negative plus true negative. Higher the prevalence, lower the negative predictive value. Overly sensitive test with lots of false positive results makes the negative predictive value higher. Now let us see about attributable risk. It is the number of cases of a disease attributable to one risk factor. It is amount by which the incidence of a condition is expected to decrease if the risk factor in question is removed. For example, if the incidence rate of lung cancer is 1 by 100 in the general population and 10 by 100 in smokers, the attributable risk of smoking in causing lung cancer is 9 by 100. This is assuming a properly matched control. Now let us see about relative risk. It compares the disease risk in people exposed with the disease risk in non-exposed. It can be calculated only after prospective or experimental studies. That is, relative risk cannot be calculated from retrospective data. Any value for relative risk other than 1 is clinically significant. For example, if the relative risk is 1.5, a person is 1.5 times more likely to develop the condition if exposed to the factor in question. If the relative risk is 0.5, the person is only half as likely to develop the condition when exposed to the factor. That is, the factor protects the person from developing the disease. Now let us see about odds ratio. It attempts to estimate a relative risk with retrospective studies like case control studies. As with relative risk, values other than 1 are significant. The odds ratio is a less than perfect way to estimate a relative risk. 
Remember, relative risk can only be calculated from prospective or experimental studies. This is a 2 cross 2 table. It is very important. In this table, this is test, this is disease. A is true positive, B is false positive, C is false negative, and D is true negative. Using this table, we can calculate sensitivity. Sensitivity is equal to A divided by A plus C. Specificity is equal to D divided by B plus D. Positive predictive value is equal to A divided by A plus B. Negative predictive value is equal to D divided by C plus D. For calculating odds ratio, it is exposure. Odds ratio is equal to A into D divided by B into C. Relative risk is equal to a divided by A plus B divided by C divided by C plus D. Attributable risk is equal to A divided by A plus B minus C divided by C plus D. Now let us see about standard deviation with a normal or bell shaped distribution. One standard deviation holds 68% of the values, two standard deviation holds 95% of the values and 3 standard division holds 99.7% of the values. This is 1 standard division, this is 2 standard division and this is 3 standard division. For example, if the mean score on a test is 80 and the standard division is 5, 68% of the scores will be within 5 points of 80 that is between 75 to 85 and 95% of the scores will be within 10 points of 80 that is between 70 to 90. Also, percentage of scores over 90 will be 2.5 because 2.5% of the scores fall below 70 and 2.5% of the scores fall over 90. Now let us see about standard error. It measures the accuracy with which a sample distribution represents a population by using standard deviation. Standard error is equal to standard deviation divided by square root of number of samples. Now let us see about measures of central tendency. Mean is the average value. Median is the middle value and mode is the most common value. Now let us take this example 2, 2, 4, 8. Mean is equal to sum of all the values divided by total number of values which is equal to 16 by 4 which is equal to 4. Median is the middle value. In this case since there are 4 values it is the average between the 2 middle numbers that is 2 and 4 which is equal to 3. Mode is equal to 2 because the number 2 appears twice more times than any other value. In a normal distribution, mean is equal to median is equal to mode. This picture shows a normal distribution. As you can see, mean is equal to median is equal to mode. A skewed distribution implies that the distribution is not normal. That is, the data do not conform to a perfect bell-shaped curve. Positive skew is an asymmetric distribution with an excess of high values. In other words, the tail of the curve is on the right as you can see in this picture. In this case, the mean is more than the median is more than the mode. Negative skew is an asymmetric distribution with an excess of low values. In other words, the tail of the curve is on the left as you can see in this picture. In this case, the mean is less than the median is less than the mode. Because skewed distributions are not normal distributions, standard deviation and mean are less meaningful values in these cases. If a distribution has two peaks, it is called as bimodal distribution. Now let us see about precision. It is the absence of random variation in a test. It refers to the consistency and reproducibility of a test. Now let us see about test reliability. Practically speaking, the reliability of a test is synonymous with its precision. Reliability measures the reproducibility and consistency of a test. For example, if the test has good inter-rater reliability, the person taking the test will get the same score if two different people administer the same test. Random error reduces reliability and precision, for example, limitation in significant figures. Now let us see about accuracy. It refers to the closeness of a measurement to the truth. Now let us see about test validity. It refers to the appropriateness of a test. Practically speaking, the validity of a test is synonymous with its accuracy. Validity measures the trueness of measurement. In other words, whether the test measures what it claims to measure. For example, if you give a valid IQ test to a genius, 
the test should not indicate that he or she is mentally challenged. Systematic error reduces validity and accuracy. For example, when the equipment is miscalibrated. Now let us see about correlation coefficient or R. It is an absolute value that indicates the strength of a relationship. It measures to what degree two variables are related. The value of the correlation coefficient ranges from minus 1 to plus 1. The important factor in determining the strength of the relationship between the two variables is the distance of the value from 0. A zero correlation equals no association whatsoever. That is, the two variables are totally unrelated. Positive 1 equals a perfect positive correlation. That is, when one variable increases, so does the other. Whereas, negative 1 equals a perfect negative correlation. That is, one, when one variable increases, the other decreases. It is important to remember that we have to use the absolute value to give the strength of correlation. For example, minus 0.3 is equal to plus 0.3. Also, a correlation coefficient of minus 0.6 is a stronger correlation coefficient than plus 0.4. Remember, we have to use the absolute value and not the symbol. Now, let us see about confidence interval. When you take a set of data from a subset of the population and calculate its mean, you want to say that it is equivalent to the mean of the whole population. However, the two means are usually not exactly equal. Now, let us see about confidence interval of 95%. It is the value used in most medical literature before data are accepted by the medical community. A confidence interval of 95% says that you are 95% confidence that the mean of the entire population is within a certain range that is usually two standard deviation of your experimental or derived mean calculated from the subset of the population that you examined. For example, if you sample the heart rate of 100 people and calculate a mean of 80 beats per minute and a standard deviation of 2, your confidence interval, also known as confidence limits, is written as x is greater than 76 is less than 84 is equal to 0.95. In other words, you are 95% certain that the mean heart rate of the whole population is between 76 and 84, that is within 2 standard deviation of the mean. Now let us see about the types of studies. From highest to lowest quality and desirability, studies are classified as experimental studies, prospective studies, retrospective studies, case series and prevalence surveys. Now let us see about experimental study. It is the gold standard study. They compare two equal groups in which one variable is manipulated and its effect is measured. Experimental studies use double blinding or at least single blinding and well-matched controls to ensure accurate data. It is not always possible to do experimental studies because of ethical concerns. A clinical trial is an experimental study comparing benefits of two or more alternative treatments. Now let us see about prospective studies. They are also known as observational, longitudinal, cohort, incidence or follow-up studies. They involve choosing a sample, dividing it into two groups based on the presence or absence of a risk factor and then following the groups over time to see what diseases they develop. For example, you can follow people with and without asymptomatic hypercholesterolemia to see if people with hypercholesterolemia have a higher incidence of myocardial infarction later in life. You can calculate relative risk and incidence from prospective studies. Prospective studies are time consuming and expensive but are practical for common diseases. Now let us see about retrospective studies. Retrospective studies are also known as case control studies. In this, we choose population samples after the fact based on the presence or absence of disease. If disease is present, they are called as cases and if disease is absent, they are called as controls. Information can be collected about risk factors. For example, you can compare people with lung cancer and people without lung cancer to see if people with lung cancer smoked more before they developed lung cancer. With a retrospective study, you can calculate an odds ratio, but you cannot calculate a true relative risk or measure incidence. Compared with prospective studies, retrospective studies are less expensive, less time consuming and more practical for rare diseases. Now let us see about case series study. A case series study simply describes the clinical presentation of people with a certain disease. This type of study is good for extremely rare diseases and may suggest a need for a retrospective or prospective study. Now let us see about prevalence survey. It is also known as cross-sectional survey. It looks at the prevalence of a disease and its risk factor at a single point in time. 
When used to compare two different cultures or populations, a prevalence survey may suggest a possible cause of a disease. The hypothesis can then be tested with a prospective study. For example, researchers have found a high prevalence of colon cancer and a high diet fat in USA versus a low prevalence of colon cancer and a diet low in fat in Japan. Now let us see about meta-analysis. It is assembling data from multiple studies to achieve greater statistical power. Now let us see about incidence and prevalence. Incidence is the number of new cases of a disease in a unit of time. Generally, one year is taken, but any time frame can be used. The incidence of a disease is equal to the absolute or total risk of developing a condition as distinguished from relative or attributable risk. Now let us see about prevalence. It is the total number of cases of a disease at a certain point in time. Two important formulae are prevalence is equal to true positive plus false negative divided by entire population. Incidence into disease duration is equal to prevalence. It is important to remember that if a disease can only be treated to the point that people can be kept alive longer without being cured, incidence remains same but the prevalence will increase because people with the disease live longer. In short term diseases like influenza, the incidence may be higher than the prevalence whereas in chronic diseases like diabetes and hypertension, the prevalence is greater than the incidence. In an epidemic, the observed incidence greatly exceeds the expected incidence. Now let us see about statistical tests. Chi-square test is used to compare percentages or proportions. It is used for non-numeric or nominal data. T-test compares the difference between two means. Analysis of variance that is ANOVA test analyzes the variance of three or more variables that is it compares three or more means. Now let us see about the types of data. Nominal data have no numeric value, for example, the day of the week. Ordinal data give a ranking but no quantification, for example, class rank which does not specify how far number 1 is ahead of number 2. Continuous data, most numerical measurements are continuous data, for example, weight, blood pressure and age. Chi-square test must be used to compare nominal or ordinal data. T-test or ANOVA test is used to compare continuous data. Now let us see about null hypothesis. It is hypothesis postulating that there is no difference between groups. Now let us see about type 1 error or alpha error. It is error of mistakenly rejecting null hypothesis. That is stating that there is a difference when there really is not. Now let us see about p-value. It is the probability of making a type 1 error or alpha error. P less than 0.05 is generally used as the cutoff for statistical significance in medical literature. If P is less than 0.05, there is less than 5% chance that the data were obtained by random error or chance. I can confidently reject the null hypothesis because the P value tells me that there is less than a 5% chance that the null hypothesis is correct. For example, if the BP in a control group is 180 by 100 mm of mercury but falls to 120 by 70 mm of mercury after drug X is given, a p-value less than 0.05 means that the chance that this difference was caused by random error or chance is less than 5%. It also means, however, that the chance that the result is random and unrelated to the drug may be as high as 4.99%. A study with a p-value less than 0.05 may still have serious flaws. A low p-value does not imply causation. A study that has Statistical significance does not necessarily have clinical significance. For example, if I tell you that drug X can lower BP from 130 by 80 to 129 by 80 mm of mercury with P less than 0.001, you will not use drug X because the result is not clinically important given the minimal BP reduction, cost and probable side effects. Now let us see about type 2 error or beta error. It is the error of failing to reject null hypothesis. Remember, in alpha error, you mistakenly reject null hypothesis, whereas in beta error, you fail to reject null hypothesis. Beta error is basically stating that there is no difference when there really is. In a type 2 or beta error, the null hypothesis is accepted when in fact it is false. Now let us see about power. It is 1 minus beta error. Power of a study 
measures the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when it is false. Power is a good thing. The best way to increase power is to increase the sample size. Now let us see about variables. Independent variable is the manipulated or experimental variable. Dependent variables are outcome variables. Now let us see about confounding variables. These are unmeasured variables that affect both the independent and dependent variables. For example, an experimenter measures the number of ashtrays owned with the incidence of lung cancer and finds that people who have lung cancer have more ashtrays. He concludes that ashtrays cause lung cancer. In this case, smoking tobacco is the confounding variable because it causes the increase in ashtrays and lung cancer. Now let us see about non-random or non-stratified sampling. CTA and CTB can be compared but they may not be equivalent. For example, if CTA is a retirement community and CTB is a college town, CTA will have higher rates of mortality and heart disease if the groups are not stratified into appropriate age specific comparisons. So this is the disadvantage of non-random or non-stratified sampling. Now let us see about bias. Bias is the term used for a situation where one outcome is more likely to occur than another. What are the ways to reduce bias? Use of placebo, blinded studies that is single blinding or double blinding, crossover studies in this each subject is own control and randomization. Now let us see about the types of bias. In observational bias, responses to subjective questions are influenced by knowing what leg of the study a patient is enrolled. In enrollment bias, it occurs when subjects are assigned to a study group in a non-random fashion. Length bias is bias that is dependent on the rate of disease progression. It may lead to overestimation of screening effectiveness in disease. Self-selection bias occurs when a patient chooses to enroll in a particular study. Now let us see about non-response bias. It occurs when people do not return printed surveys or do not answer the phone in a phone survey. If non-response accounts for a significant percentage of the results, the experiment will suffer. The first strategy in this situation is to visit or call the non-responders repeatedly. If this strategy is unsuccessful, we have to list the non-responders as unknown in the data analysis and see if any results can be salvaged. We should never make up or assume responses. Now let us see about lead time bias. It is caused by time differentials. It occurs when screening tends to prolong the time between diagnosis and death without actually affecting true survival. The classic example of lead time bias is a cancer screening test that claims to prolong survival compared with older survival data when in fact the difference is only due to earlier detection and not because of improved treatment or prolonged survival. Now let us see about admission rate bias. The classic admission rate bias occurs when an experimenter compares the mortality rates for myocardial infarction or some other disease in hospitals A and B and concludes that hospital A has a higher mortality rate. The higher mortality rate may be caused by tougher admission criteria at hospital A which admits only the sickest patients with myocardial infarction. Hence, hospital A has higher mortality rates although its care may be superior. The same admission rate bias can apply to a surgeon's mortality and morbidity rates if he or she takes only tough cases. Now let us see about recall bias. It is a risk in all retrospective studies. It occurs when people cannot remember exactly. So they may inadvertently overestimate or underestimate risk factors. For example, Kumar died of lung cancer and his angry widow remembers him as smoking like a chimney whereas Ram died of non-smoking related causes and his loving wife denies that he smoked much. In fact, both men smoked one pack per day, but there is recall bias in this case. Now let us see about interviewer bias. It occurs in the absence of blinding. The scientist receives big money to do a study and wants to find a difference between cases and controls. Thus, he or she inadvertently calls the same patient comment or outcome not significant in the control group and significant in the treatment group. This is called as interviewer bias. Now let us see about unacceptability bias. It occurs when people do not admit to embarrassing behavior, claim to exercise more than they do to please the interviewer or claim to take experimental medications when they spit them out. This is called as unacceptability bias. 
If you have any suggestions, please let me know in the comment section. For more such videos, please check out my playlists. If you like my videos, kindly subscribe. Your subscription will encourage me to make more videos. Thank you.